questions or comments? Uh, we have kind of covered like chronologically some philosophical reasons for uh, writing a research paper and uh, and then some technical um, you know uh, tricks to, to to be more productive. Uh, and uh, another thing that I forgot to mention is that. Uh, the best way to remain productive, of course, is you read constantly. Uh, I know we all are busy, and we have some. Okay, okay. So, uh, so we we have to find time. So my graduate students ask me, uh, you know, usually they are all looking for shortcuts, right? So they ask me, give us one way that would enable us to be able to express ourselves better as scholars orally as well as uh, in writing. So I tell them, OK, where do you see me the most outside of my office? And there's like at the coffee house. We have this beautiful coffee house right next to our campus. So I ask them, OK, what do you see me doing most of the times? And they said, well, you're always reading a book, and you have a pen in your hand and a highlighter. So I told them, for the last 10 years, every single day of my life, I read for two hours. right? And I read new materials. And I read vastly, sometimes, things not related to my knowledge. So I tell them, read for two hours every single day. Find time. Make it into something that m makes your day. You're like you're looking forward to those two hours. And in about five years, you will start noticing the difference in your perception, in how you understand your field, because the things you read, the things you take notes on, will become part of your consciousness. And that's a long-term process, but if you try it, you will see. Four to five years, you will see the difference. Uh, because, I mean, scholarly writing as well as teaching is no longer about how uh, notes notes I think we have moved way beyond that, the, the knowledge itself and how it's applied, what the expectations are, are, are now more complex. But there is also another imperative on you, uh, you know, as a nation. Uh, and that is that you know we are producing great computer programmers. We are producing great industrialists. We are producing great scientists. We are not producing many internationally known humanists, right? So when it comes to humanities in the global arena, we hardly have any voices. And so we need to, I mean, we are a nation of 175 million people. We need to have our internationally recognized scholars, the scholars who, who, who publish and then have a voice. Um, and I think that's crucial, and publishing is crucial to that. So before I go to the next slide, um, any questions or comments that you would like to say? I don't know your names, but I can point out and ask someone to ask a question. You know. There's a conversation there, so you can ask a question. Absolutely. Um, uh, if you, if you, if we could go back. Uh, The, the, the link you see at the bottom uh, is the link to Purdue's uh, writing website, Purdue University. And if you just follow this link and then bookmark their main page, not only do they have how to cite APA and MLA, uh, there's, a, there's a whole wealth of resources about how to write a paper, how to structure your paper. Most of our students go to this website. Uh, but other than that, most universities' uh, writing programs have their own websites which are open to the public where all these resources are available. Yeah. Uh, there are also softwares that you can use. I don't recommend it, but you can use RefWorks. 
and other softwares that would do the work for you. You just put the information in and they format it for you uh, in APA or MLA or uh, any other uh, Chicago citation system. So, and uh, yeah, okay. Any other questions? So we have to break this, uh, you know, totally male-dominant patriarchal mode of asking questions and have some questions from this side. So, Gee. Yeah, I mean, that's really a very valid point. And of course, I will mention it to them. But you know, HEC is like Mathya Rangila, right? Uh, when they like you, they give you a lot. When they don't like you, they just basically isolate you. So it's an institution that's not answerable to anyone other than the office of the prime minister. We have helped them in so many ways whenever they are in trouble, when someone is trying to oust them and all. But they conveniently forget, you know. But absolutely. But there is another way, too, uh, which, like there are representatives from four different universities here, which can be done very easily on local level. And that is we have that. All university systems in the United States are state university systems. So in Texas, because it's so big, we have the state of Texas university system and then North Texas university system. So all university systems, all the major flagship universities then have a collab collaboration. So the students who are enrolled in our universities can access their catalog, right? And if we don't have a book in our library, we ask our librarian, and they get it for us on interlibrary loan. Right? So all it takes is four or five universities coming together and signing some kind of an understanding, saying, OK, our student with our ID should be able to use UMT library or should be able to use LUMS library. They can even be a fee. Right? Um, and other ways, interlibrary loans. Uh, and uh, for us, you know, it's a national network. Sometimes if you need an article and it's only available with Stanford, you know, our librarians would contact them. So these are the things that can be done without spending any extra money. All it needs is uh, a bit of vision and the heads of schools and universities reaching out to each other and saying, how can we share our resources? Uh, but as far as, uh, of course, talking to HEC, uh, you know, I'm always, uh, I, I met Fermano Lanjam last year. I'm meeting him again. And uh, he's really a nice guy. But uh, most of the times, you know, they, they hear you out and then they go and do whatever they want to do. But I will definitely talk to them. Another more important thing is there is another resource called uh, archive.org, right? Just archive.org. Uh, it's, it's a free resource. And what they have done is 
<coughs> they have, through a federal grant, they have scanned, uh, like Cornell University gave them all the books that are out of copyright. So basically all the books that were published probably 80 years ago, all those books have been scanned and put into archive.org. So chances are if you're looking for a resource in humanities and in any other field which is either out of copyright or is open access, you can access that. Uh, there is another resource called uh, uh, Directory of Open Access Journals, doaj.org, right? Uh, now they call it about, I don't know, about 30,000 journals. Now you ha you'll have to be careful because you'll have to read carefully and see what the quality of research is, but anything that's available in open access in all the fields is available on that website. Um, so these are some of the resources that, of course, you can use without having your own library. But of course, nothing uh, matches the, uh, you know, the possibilities available with having a research library of your own. Yeah. Anything else? That's a very good question. Okay, so the world has moved into knowledge economy. You know, there is a term for it. Carlo Barcelona theorizes it, you know, cognitariat. You and I are part of the cognitariat. So if you look at the policies coming from Canada, United States, and European Union in the last few years, uh, the most important part of legislation is copyright law. And the reason is that they are trying to control knowledge. There is no doubt about it, especially medical research. And also scientific and medical basic research used to be funded by federal government in the United States. Now that has been drastically reduced and privatized. Now when research is federally funded, one condition always is that it will be freely available. Now when the corporations are investing in this kind of research, then they have the copyright on it. Uh, so uh, I, don't, I don't agree with the idea that good research can only be produced in, in the developed countries, because uh, yes, some kind of research, some kind of research here which needs a certain kind of basic knowledge which is copyrighted might be affected. But social sciences research, humanities research, research in business models, or you know, uh, community outreach programs, anything that has to deal with life in Pakistan can be pretty much done better here because we have the native experts, we have local people living over here. So any American scholar or any American um, researcher who thinks they can do a better job than you and you here, I think that, that, that's a fiction. Uh, all you need to do is just learn the tools, right? And then you have the lived experience. Uh, there is, of course, an, a resource imbalance. But there are huge movements against that, too. The open access movement is a huge movement in the world. I'm a part of it. Uh, they constantly keep fighting these fights to uh, declare certain research areas, certain uh, things open. So they actually go and seek out, okay, this study has come out, uh, how much of it was federally funded? If there is just this much of federal funding there, they will sue you in court to make it public. Uh, universities in America are increasingly creating their own repositories. Uh, basically all they ask us is if, if we funded your research or you did your research on a federal grant, if you publish it somewhere, you will also upload it to your own institutional repository. So that way, it's freely available. So yes, there is that inequality in terms of access to resources. Absolutely, I agree with that. Uh, and that can somehow give researchers, especially in hard sciences, uh, somewhat of an edge. Uh, and, 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 and of course, as a post-colonialist, I think that knowledge should be free, right? So for me, it is already uh, an unequal global division of knowledge. Uh, and, uh, but having said that, I, I, I agree with you that I think that's a fiction created by the powers that be. 
I think we can do great research and, uh, and you know, we have more to say. On, you know, the third world so-called is, is the majority, right? In this region alone, uh, you know, we have one billion people in China, one billion in India, 175, 180 million here, Bangladesh. We constitute more than, you know, 45% of the world's population. So to say that we don't have much to contribute to the world is, is a fiction that's, that's, that's unsustainable, even in the West, yeah. Okay, so any questions before we move on to uh, how to submit an article? Comments? What, what do you get from the previous slide, the role of theory? Here. Means that in the research, uh, we have to take one theory to make our research readable or publishable across mm -hmm. the world. Is it so? Uh, yes and no. I mean, there are some journals that are completely anti-theory. Uh, my department has a journal called Studies in the Novel. They are just totally anti-theory. They just want a good explanation of the text. But if you're publishing with critical inquiry, if you're publishing with social text, PMLA, Journal of Commonwealth Literature, these are some of the journals that I can name. You will have to use really sophisticated theory. So that's what I'm coming to right now is that when, when you are writing and you have finished your first draft and you are revising it, now is the time to know which is your targeted journal you know, where would you like to publish it, right? So how do you find that out? You know, so you, in order to find the right journal in your field, you go to the, the database that deals with it. For English studies, for example, it's the MLA uh, list of journals and MLA bibliography. These are the two sources. Uh, you can look up journals there and see which one would be a useful one for you. For linguistics also, you can just do a web search to find the top tiered linguistic journals. Now in your case, since you are reporting somewhat to HEC's requirements, so you'll also have to deal with the impact factor journals. I don't know where they picked up that model. Um, I think it works for sciences. For humanities it doesn't because even PMLA is not listed with Thompson's, right? And it's the flagship journal of English studies. Uh, so by forcing you to publish just in impact factor journals, they've already drastically reduced the places you can publish. And what it also doesn't acknowledge is that you don't just get to the top tier journals in the, with the very first article, right? you have to establish a little history of publishing internationally, right? So you may not publish in a top tier journal, but you do get a publication. Though it does two things, as we were talking about. It gives you a feeling that you have been acknowledged, you have been recognized, your job, your article has been published. But next time when you send an article to a slightly higher tier journal, your CV already says that, that you have published elsewhere. Now, if according to HEC, your every article needs to be targeted to an impact factor journal, chances are by the time you get your third re rejection, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll basically say, you know, I don't want to play this game anymore. Because like, you know, most prestigious journals they have a very high rejection rate. I mean, I just published with South Asia, a journal of South Asian studies, uh, and that article was very crucial to me because I was revising my own stance on so many things. Uh, I mean, I jumped through a thousand hoops to get that article published, but they only accept 5% of the articles submitted to you, so five out of 100. So sometimes you do, work with them because you know that the prize is too big. But most of the times, I think you should be able to see under the circumstances what kind of paper you have written, what level it is, and which journal would fit it. So then you go to a specific journal. 
And then you read on every journal web page, there should be a link that gives you author guidelines. Right? Read those guidelines, because the guidelines would tell you what, what should be the length of your abstract, how long an article would they accept, what kind of citation system they use, what is their review process, how long does it take. So the author guidelines page should technically give you all the information that you need about the journal. And there should be also a page about journal style. Is it APA, MLA, Chicago, which one? And they sometimes give you examples of how they want the citations to work, right? So you don't have to really start to reinvent the wheel. After you've done that, then you send a query email, right, to the editor if you have a question. But mostly it's polite to say, you know, and I'm going to give go to an example of that. So, so a query email, which used to be a query letter, is basically you contacting an editor of a journal and asking them, Introducing yourself briefly and saying, I have written an article on this topic. Uh, would you be interested in reviewing it for a you know, possible publication? So when you send in a query letter, just make sure that you put submission query in your subject. Because most editors get a lot of emails. And if, if there is an email which has no subject in it, chances are they'll just delete it. But if it says submission query, then the editor knows someone has contacted me to know how to publish in my journal. So make sure that you have a subject line. Um, do not, please, please do not use texting language in your emails. So don't say, do you publish, you know, like write full sentences. You know, the, your email shows them you know, how good a writer you are. So please use full formal language in that. Avoid any kind of personal stories. Sometimes I get emails and they start with, you know, my head of the department hates me and my job is at stake and my children need more money and would, if you publish this article, it will do everything for me. Don't do that, you know, I mean, it, it's, it doesn't come across well, but it doesn't work either, you know. No one is going to publish your article, at least in a peer-reviewed journal, simply because your job is imperiled, right? Uh, but just avoid those sob stories. Um, it's funny how many you get of those stories. Uh, I love that about Pakistanis. I, I do that all the time, too. We always, we don't hesitate to tell what's going on. You know, so if HEC is really pushing you hard, you, you talk about it. But just make sure that you know, it comes across as very odd to an American editor if you start your first conversation with a very personal story. Right? Um, so then, as I said, you just go through author guidelines first. So basically make sure that you're asking in your query email what is not already covered on the website. Because if the question is already in the author guidelines, the, all the editor would say is tell you, uh, please go to our author guidelines section. Right? So you've just wasted an email. So ask, your query should be about something that's not already transparent and covered. Right? So I have a little example here, just a simple email. you know. Um, be, uh, and this is what I find fascinating. We always uh, start a conversation in real life uh, as part of Pakistani culture by saying, you know, how are you doing? Hope you're well, right? But a lot of people forget that when they write a formal email. I mean, so start with a small greeting. I hope this finds you well, and then who you are, you know. Uh, I am so and so working at such and such university, and then I have just recently finished a paper on this topic. I was wondering if you will be interested in reviewing that. And that there's no need of attaching your CV, just your information at the bottom, and of course they already have your email, and that should do it. So can we go back? Any questions about that? This is really important.
And uh, there's another thing, uh, that's when we go to the submission. So. Okay, so now uh, you're ready. Your queries have been answered. Uh, you have tailored your paper exactly to the length that your selected journal wants, exactly to the format in which they want it. If they say that it should be single space, it should be single space. If they want one-inch margins, it should be one-inch margins. If they want digital copies, you email them. If they want one digital copy and two hard copies, you do that, you mail them. Now you would be wondering, why would a journal want hard copies in this technical age, right? It's a very simple reason. Each journal must send their articles to two reviewers. Now sometimes the reviewers say, we wouldn't work on a digital copy, we want a hard copy, right? So if the journal prints out two copies for every article received, that's a lot of paper and toner. Right? So basically, pragmatically, they will ask you to give two hard copies, and then those will go to the reviewers. Now, most refereed journals do a double-blind review, right? And a double-blind review is simply, simply that the author doesn't know who the reviewers are, and the reviewers don't know who the author is. So make sure that there is nothing in your paper that can identify you as an author. So, of course, you're not going to put your name there, your institution there. Um, even if you're citing yourself or building up on your own work, use the third person. Don't say I and then give a reference to an article that can identify you. Sometimes if, if they're really stringent about blind review policy, they will just reject you for not following the blind review policy. So please be, uh, make sure that you don't do that. Um, and then uh, you submit according to whatever guidelines the journal has. Uh, most of the times the editors would send you a confirmation email. If not, just send them a polite reminder and ask them if they got your article. Now, one other thing that you can do sometimes, so when you're submitting online, you submit your article as well as your CV, right? Especially if you have a good CV, so do submit it. Um, and s let's say you're writing about a very controversial topic. You're picking up a fight with some big scholar in the field, or you're challenging certain political assumptions. So do mention it in the email to the editor. Say that this is a very slightly controversial topic. And if you send it to the reviewers who are ideologically on the right, they might just not like it for ideological reasons. So please send it to some reviewers who are open to a different way of looking at this. So then the editor knows, at the end of the day, it's the editor who's going to decide, but they know that there is something in this article which needs more than a generic reviewer. Because sometimes an article, article can just be, get bad reviews because the reviewer you know, you, you didn't like your politics, right? So you do want to put it in there to, for the editor to find a reviewer who would be open-minded. Uh, I have to do that a lot of times because my work is very political. Any questions so far? Okay, so now your reviews are back. So chances are you submitted your article and in about four months, three months, four weeks, eight weeks, depending on the journal, uh, you will get two reviews. Now there is a, a gradation of how a reviewer recommends a paper. So the least, the last one of them is uh, do not accept. So if you get two rejections, um, that means that this journal is not going to publish you or reconsider you. You go and find another journal, revise. Even if you get a rejection, you'll get two reviews. right? So read those reviews and see what the reviewer said about your article. Incorporate those in your essay and then send it elsewhere. right? Don't be disheartened. It happens to all of us. Then, okay, so the second level of recommendation that a reviewer that can give is 
publish with major revisions, right? Now that already means that you will have to structurally really rework your essay, right? But even when an editor tells you that this, here, is the, here are the rep reports, and we will consider your article after you incorporate the reviewer's recommendations, that's almost an 80% acceptance. Because the, pub the editor had the option of saying, sorry, the reviews are not so good. So take it seriously, make those changes, and send it back. And then there is publication with minor revisions. Now that's absolutely an acceptance. If an editor sends you back your reviews and says the reviewers have recommended these minor changes, uh, please send it back to us after revision. Just take a couple of weeks and send it back. Time is really important because the editors are under pressure too. Okay, we have to have our articles ready before our publication date. So the biggest crisis happens when at the last minute someone pulls an article and you don't have anything ready behind to plug that gap, right? So they would work with you. But if it is published with minor revisions, take two days off, three days off, revise it, send it back. It is an acceptance. And within two, three days, you will hear back from the editor who would say, we are happy with your revisions and your article would be published in such and such issue. So these are the gradations of how reviewers grade your paper. Now each review would come back, one to two page review of your article. Now is your time to read the reviews. So you first of all, you see what is it that they have liked, right? So you can strengthen that. And what is it that they disagree with or have asked you to improve? Now, see whether it's a substantial suggestion or is it ideologically based, but as long as it's an academic substantial suggestion, incorporate it in your revision. And so you make your changes. Now, it's always best that when you send back your article, your revised article, you write a brief note. Some journals would ask you for it, some may not. But in your email, mention, this is how I have revised my paper. So here was a point from reviewer A. I have now incorporated such and such source on page so and so. Just a brief note, one page. But tell them, this is how you have revised your article. Now remember, it's not yet an accepted paper. But when you do that, the editor already will be thinking, oh, you know, this person is really serious. Not only have they revised the paper, she has also sent me where exactly has she revised the paper, right? So that shows your, your seriousness, but also it enables the editor to make a quick decision. <coughs> now, if a journal accepts your article without review, just be extra skeptical, okay? I mean, no journal, refereed journal, worthy of its name, will ever accept an article without review unless it's an invited article. And that happens only to like internationally known scholars. Right? So look up the journal. Chances are it's probably a fake journal trying to make money. Also in humanities, if a journal asks you to pay a publication fee, be very skeptical. Now some of them unfortunately are listed, uh, listed as impact factor journals. I don't know how they got there. But remember, impact, impact factor is nothing scientific. All the Thompsons does is goes and gathers through metadata through their harvester, the number of times a journal is cited. Trust me, if you give me one year, I can launch a journal and make in an impact factor journal within two years by just creating fake citations. Okay. Uh, but be very skeptical in humanities if a journal charges you a publishing fee. Now, because of the open access movement and open journal system software, Sadly, it has become a, an industry where uh, a, a two or three people with a good IT guy can launch 30 or 40 fake journals. And you'll be surprised to know the headquarter of these fake journals is where? Uh, 
Gujaram Wala <laughs> and Faisalabad. Uh, these are the two places uh, uh, where most of these fake journals are launched from. So what they do is they buy a New York IP address and launch their website from there and usually it has a name of you know academic world or scholarly journals plus or something like that and uh, the best way to know is just look at their editorial base first of all look at their description of uh, of their company there are always spelling errors in it the english is terrible uh, but also look at the editorial boards but if you want to be further clear there is a list that's issued by a librarian it comes um, it's called beals b e a l l apostrophe at beals list of predatory journals if you just do a google search on it uh, what he does is I mean, I don't like his stance on open access because I think he's anti-open access, but he goes and finds all these predatory journals and looks at them and gives you a list of, you know, this journal is fake, this journal is fake, this journal is fake. So do s search uh, and, and make sure, because it's your work, you put a lot of effort in it. Uh, yeah, you need to publish, but, you know, you, you should publish somewhere where, where it's read by people and where it means something instead of giving it to these people who are charging you $200 for publishing your article in a fake journal. So, and that's, that's pretty much uh, responding to the reviews and my story about fake journals. Okay. So. Okay, so uh, most articles, as I said, it takes about a year for an article to actually come out. So after you send your revised version in, the editors would... Uh, before I go there, I forgot to mention that there are also two ways of review. Some journals, before sending out your article to review, will do an in-house review. That means the editors would sit together and read the papers and decide which ones should they send out to review. So if your, if your article doesn't make the first cut, they would basically write you a polite email and say that it doesn't relate to their journal, so they are not sending it out to review. If it makes the first cut, then they would decide to send it to review. But most journals, they receive all articles and thus immediately assign them to reviewers. Uh, PMLA, sadly, for which I re reviewed, has a very terrible uh, system. So they send your articles to review to specialists who recommend or not recommend your article. And then the PMLA board, which comprises five people, none of them specialists in your field, decides which ones they are going to publish. So we have fought them on it all the time. I had two articles that went to the final stage both the times. Uh, Patricia Yeager, the former editor, and Simon Gikandi, who's the current editor, they worked with me on the phone to revise the paper. I had their votes, but my article wasn't accepted. So they have a bizarre system. But most of them would either first decide in-house and then send it out to review, or not send it out to review. But it's a one-year to two-year process, so don't be too hasty. But don't also start the month before you're supposed to report your progress. So that means if, if you are coming up for review two years down the line and you need three articles in peer-reviewed journals, now is the time to start sending them out because it takes time. So then you will get uh, most journals would send you uh, uh, a file with copy editor's suggestions. And the copy editors usually use Microsoft Word, and they use track changes. Now, please go through every suggestion. Don't just do accept all, OK? Because sometimes you are the best judge of whether that change is needed or not. A copy editor of a good journal will not change a single word in your paper without you approving it. Okay, So it will come to you as track changes, and you go, you wade through the whole list 
and you accept, 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 then there will be some comments. The copy editor, no, the copy editor is not a, an expert in your field. The copy editor is reading your essay for clarity and for basic sentence structure. So sometimes they will tell you this is faulty parallelism. Uh, do you mean this in this sentence? So it's your job to look at the notes and look at the comments and correct accordingly. And then you accept changes, goes back to the copy editor. The copy editor reads it again and will then send it to the layout editor. Okay. And so the layout editor is the one who actually produces the galleys, right? The way your article would look when it's finally published. And at that stage, uh, the article would, will go to the journal's proofreader. The proofreader would read it for minor typos and errors, commas, extra spaces, and put his or her comments with the paper. And then you have the final word. It will come to you. You will have to proofread your paper line by line. But do keep in mind, you cannot ask for major revisions, change this sentence or no. The galley has already been set. All you can change is a comma here or a spelling error here. So chances are most journal editors will not entertain, they will tell you, we do not entertain big chunks of change in the layout, in the, in the final galleys. Uh, so make sure that when you did your copy editing, you were satisfied with everything in your paper. <clears throat> After you approve the copy editing is then when your article will go to print. And the editor would tell you, most of the times when they send you the proofs, the, the, it's, it's a full proof, so you already know the issue title is on the side, so you already know when it's coming up. But they will confirm to you that it's coming. Now, if it's a print journal, uh, most of them will send you off prints of your article. Some of them may also send you a copy of your article, uh, of the journal in which your article was published. Uh, but do ask for it. You know, Can you get the off prints? At least you will get a digital copy of the of your article. Uh, so that's roughly the whole process. And I think the next slide is day two. Yeah. So I mean, that kind of concludes my conversation today. By the way, these orchids that you see in these two pictures are the ones that I grow uh, in my house. So I thought I should put the pictures there. So if you have any questions or comments, anything, I will take that. Tomorrow, uh, I, I hope we have a whiteboard here. If not, if we could have one. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Basically, we will uh, go over how to craft a thesis sentence. And I'll put up a few examples of how does an introduction of a published paper look like, and how, how does a thesis look like. And then do some brainstorming and have write down some thesis statements that you would like to share with us. And we'll put them on the board and then work with them and see how to tweak them, how do they work, and whether they work or not. So any questions or anything that you would like to say? Well, uh, and that's unfortunate. That shouldn't happen, but it does. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one, first of all, one is how do you know how to write?
by in a style that's involved in the United States and Canada. Right? You read the articles that are being published over there. Right? So basically, if you read more of them, not only would you grasp the language, but also the structure of an argument. So there is no shortcut to that. So uh, if you read, like, and that's why you always read articles of the journal that you're sending your article to. But it's a long-term solution. Because who? Uh, and uh, as opposed to any of us, you know, I am troubled by this. That, okay, we have knowledge, we are producing it, but we must produce it in the language of our former or current masters, right? But we can either just make that an initiative and just kick off scholarship, or we do, like, you know, what Kalaban does. Right? So this is your language, and it is. With the path of uh, native colonial colonized subjects claiming their humanity was that I can learn your words and I can write beautiful things in them too. So instead of seeing it as that Americans are forcing to write this, write in their style, we could also take it up as a challenge and say, we can do it. Right? I mean, I, I, I teach in America, I teach literature, and so Teaching math is easier. You don't need to know the culture. You just teach math. When you teach literature at that level, you have to understand how does American culture work, what are its narratives, how is meaning construed there. And obviously, I have my accent, which some of my students think is cool. But on the other hand, you have to know the language with the same degree of sophistication as your American peers. You know? And so we do that. So, I mean, one thing is, but in a short term, if they are saying, look, the only problem we have your article is that the language doesn't work for us, then they are also saying is that we are happy with the content, right? So then, you know, get, get someone, you know, anyone who has some kind of better English and tell them, can you edit this for me? Give them, you know, those are their things are they do teaching to them. Because at the end of the day, your mission is not simply that you should be published the way you wrote it. Your mission as a scholar is that your work should be out there, working for your field and for you. But in the long run, you know, more reading into the style in which current scholarship is being done would automatically train you to write them. There are so many Italian, uh, Turkish, even Iranian writers who are getting published, they're being published. So what is the problem with the Pakistani writers? I mean, the fiction writers or scholars? No, 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 so, in the research journals. Uh, no, I've uh, come yeah. across so many articles. Like yeah, that. I think the biggest problem we have is that uh, we have sort of de-emphasized humanities. And also, we are not fully, like, really funding social sciences. And we have given so many resources to STEM disciplines, right? Technology, science. And so we are actually not producing good resources for scholarly writing of this kind, scholarly writing that deals with culture. Whereas the Iranians, they are putting a lot of resources in it. Turkish government is putting a lot of resources in humanities. And it's, a, it's an imperative for them, because what is the Turkish government fighting for is to keep their constitution secular. Right? Uh, how do you keep your constitution secular? It's not by having more computer engineers, right? Or by having more doctors, by having more humanists, right? Because it's humanists, humanists who teach literature, who teach poetry, who teach culture and history, who can fight against any kind of appropriation of a secular constitution, whether you like it or not. So they are putting more resources into humanities and humanistic research and writing. Uh, similarly, but on, on our end, you know, humanities pretty much is, in all big universities here, is kind of like a stepchild, right? When we leave them, Jodha Rasku, Gladiyam, Pace Mark, 
شیف کیوں بھی پالی ہے ایک مشاعرہ کو آ گیا اگر 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 اگ That's the only way. I mean, what do you do when I when I am trying to argue against someone? I mean, who do I call? It's not Faza or Faz, right? It's like a more radical Habib Jale. It's like a more radical Ustad Bauman, right? So I mean, poetry gives us the expressions and the ability to say things that we cannot really say in prose, right? So I think that's one of the main reasons that so much of good work is coming out of here. Dr. Musaf, you have shared with us the science of uh, writing your article, the whole process. But having produced your first draft, you need to rewrite. Could you share with us the art of rewriting? Yeah, that, that's a very important question. And, and it's, it's very subjective. So for me, okay, this book that you mentioned, Parabenization of America. Um, Three months ago, I was reading an article and I said, I'm going to write this book. Uh, and I had a rough idea. So I started writing. But the first draft was getting my argument, what do I feel about it, what do I say. Any theory that I already knew or history incorporating that. And so I have my first draft. I have three chapters, I've written my argument and everything, and now, the rewriting was, for example, in the chapter two where I discuss neoliberalism and uh, current economic structure in the world. Now I have to give it a philosophical grounding. Okay, so where does the concept of private private property come from in the Western part? Right? How does private property become part of human self? Um, what did Adam Smith say about laissez-faire economics? Right? Where did he say that? Uh, are there any challenges to it? So that is more reading John Law, right? Especially the second treatise, right? Uh, we're looking at how Locke theorizes the state of nature, but within that, what are the limitations on acquisition? Because Locke clearly says that, you know, an individual, whatever an individual acquires with his labors is a part of his self and therefore not external to it. So that's upon which has been built the edifice of property law in the West, right? But then he says that most people would not require more than what they need. Right? Now that principle falls by the wayside in modern economics, because we always acquire more than what we need. Then you go to Adam Smith, how does he rewrite it? But where I'm trying to get to is to point out that laissez-faire economics doesn't work. And it doesn't work because the principles that you are based upon are for a different mode of production. And we have moved on into a different mode of production. Now these things, inception of these debates, comes in the rewriting process. That's where, you know, you just cite, you know, cite Adam Smith here. You just give yourself a clue. Cite Locke. Well, of course, it's presupposing that you're privy to these things already in terms of your knowledge. But if not, you just say, find someone who discusses this. Right? And then the rewriting process, which for me takes the longest time, is going back and then embedding your philosophical sources and your discussion and connecting them. Uh, so I finished the first draft in 30 days. I'm still working on revising it. I was supposed to have sent it out in mid-June to my editor. I'm still not done with it. So that's how long it takes, the revision process. Uh, uh, if I have written a dissertation as a front-to-city, like, for example, a master's degree, then I or can I not turn it into a research article and get published? You can absolutely uh -huh. do that. Yeah, I mean, I would strongly recommend it, unless, if it's a master's thesis, unless you're going to use it as a dissertation project, too, okay. and expand on it. But here's, I don't know what for format you are required to write in. Uh, but that's another thing that bothers me about literature dissertations that people tell me it's an HEC requirement. 
uh, literature dissertations in Pakistan are being written like a social science dissertation. So you have your uh, uh, problem statement, your methodology, and then your uh, literature. Uh, now, we don't write literature dissertations like that. And because we don't write like that, our students write it like a book. So then it's easier for them to transform it into a book. Now if you pick up a dissertation written over here, I just reviewed one of KWPT. So if you ask that person convert it into a book, what do they have? I no book, what its name says, here is my methodology and here is my literature review. No, the literature review is embedded in your discussion. So you have a major thing ahead of you if you want to convert it into a book. You have to actually rewrite the whole dissertation in a book form. So that's the problem we probably will have to encounter too, just to change the form. But usually a master's thesis at least should have one good article in it, which you should be able to polish and send out. Um, when we are talking about scholarly publications, what about non-scholarly creative impulse? Like, if we write fiction, what is our standing in the work? Okay, like, oh, I mean, uh, children's stories and... Oh, that's absolutely great. I mean, look, uh, already Pakistanis are producing a lot of good literature in English, right? And of course, we have a history of great literature in Urdu and Punjabi and Pashto and other languages. Uh, so, it would depend on, in my context, it would depend on what your position is in the department. So in my department, I am a post colonialist, so I'm expected to publish in my team. If I do poetry and fiction, which I do publish, that doesn't count. But it does count symbolically in the world, but not, my department couldn't care less if I publish a poem or not. But if you're hired as a poet, like we have three poets, Right? Uh, we have two uh, novelists and we have two creative nonfiction professors because we offer a PhD in creative writing. So for them, that's what they want publication is, that's what they want. But as a Pakistani writer, I would strongly encourage you to, to absolutely publish your poetry as well as your fiction. Whether it does something good for you for your job or not. So I guess, what was this? Not related to the presentation, but the attitude of the local journal editors. I mean, it may not be the proper forum to talk about this issue, but as you have meetings with the SEC officials, we have some uh, humanities journal published in major cities in Pakistan. And then I have personal experience as well as my colleagues as well. Then the editor response is never positive. You keep on sending the mail, you keep on asking them acknowledge, 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 and for three and four months they don't even bother to reply. Yeah, uh, what kind of this attitude, I mean, is and how can we, I, mean, I get demoralized when I don't get even the acknowledgement received of my paper, which I have written for six months. Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree that. Uh I mean, there is, of course, we need a bigger change in, in our academic culture. And you all are privy to it, you're all senior professors, is that one reason, one part of a lot of people want to make full professors here, not a lot, but some of them just think that, okay, you know, I, I, I can stop working now. Right? So, the status is me, I said that. Similarly for editors. Second thing is, you know, how does how do you launch a journal in Pakistan? HEC gives you money, right? That's Baralakate Salana who update. So half of the times the reasons are very cynical. But people just launch a journal because HEC funds it, so they allocate those funds, they get to submit me salary daily, assistant editor, make me daily. So they are basically doing it for that, they are not really committed scholars. But part of it is also how we we have a hierarchical culture. And, and I mean, it's, it's not good, not bad, but that's the that. And sometimes people who get into a powerful position, instead of enabling more people, this, right? so they, they become power brokers, and they start deciding. Yeah. So I, th I think that's a wrong attitude. Uh, 
you know, would I wish for it to change? Absolutely. But I think the only way it would change is if people like you and more dedicated people who've seen this side of the story get to that side and then don't become like them. <laughs> So just look at the journal policy. If there is no indication from their policy, then ask the editor. Right? Because you don't want to be in a position where, two, where one journal has already sent your things for review. I mean, uh, you know, a Pakistani scholar did that to me. You know, we had accepted a journal, we were article, we were laying it out, and she said it has been accepted by such and such journal. And, uh, you know, I told her, fine, you know, you can take your article, but, I mean, I'm not a vindictive person, but naturally, if I interact with, with her again, I will not trust her as a scholar. So just make sure that you're fair. But if, if, you, if in doubt, ask the editor, do you accept simultaneous submissions? So I tell you about the turning report to the one I'm sending my article. You don't need to. I mean, the turn it in report is for you. Most, uh, we don't do plagiarism check. We already are, reviewers would point it out, basically. And if there is, I've had in my five years of publishing one person who had plagiarized. And she was a graduate student, but uh, she had not actually plagiarized in the body of the article, but her footnotes were plagiarized. So our, our reviewers caught that and we had to decline that view. So our return it in is for you to make sure that you're accidentally not plagiarizing. How do footnotes can be plagiarized? Pardon? Footnotes can be plagiarized. How can they be plagiarized? I mean, if, I, if you say, cite in your paper, if Baal, Lama, give me a footnote and put the Wikipedia entry under it. In a footnote, that's an act of pages. Is that all? And just one final comment from our side. Thank you, Dr. Oh, thank you. It has been a great pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you so much.